Hey, Resurrection Church, what a powerful time of worship and so thankful that we have this moment together that we could share the Word of God. Today I'm here with my friend uh, John Hammer, a dear, dear friend, part of our network, our covenant groups across the nation, um, connected to US Cal and CCC. And we're going to have a discussion uh, on unity. So today we want to continue in the vein of unity or oneness, church oneness. Um, we know there's a difference between unity and oneness. Oneness is more of an outgrowth of unity. Mm -hmm. Unity is common cause coming together, uh, but it's not the end all. Unity should always result in oneness. Uh, is there any aspect of oneness that you think is really um, needed to be understood better in the church that perhaps we take for granted we just make it a routine but it is in a it's a powerful symbol of oneness yeah. that we need to understand yeah absolutely i mean what 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 well i would say what the connection between uh, communion um and the lord's table and unity you know the lord's body how, how are the implications of that and uh, we were talking a little bit about first corinthians chapter 11 and yeah Paul's teaching on communion and how it relates to unity, oneness, uh, all of the above. Yeah, I know Pastor Michael Moore was teaching on community and communion and communion leading to oneness this week. And uh, we could expound a little bit about that today. When we look at 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul the Apostle said, I've received from the Lord that which also... I have given to you that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he broke bread, and after he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And, uh, and then he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians 11, where that came from, starting with verse 17, we have to go back to verse 1, where basically it's describing a church service. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul is telling the women to wear head coverings because in those days the head coverings signified that they were taken, that they were part of a family or uh, as the, the women, the older women, who didn't have head coverings. It looked like they were female worshipers of the goddess and mm -hmm. prostitutes, temple prostitutes. That's why he told them to wear head coverings. Uh, but the context of that was a church service, most likely in a house. And then in communion, which mm -hmm. normally was a dinner that culminated with taking the bread and drinking the cup, the wine, uh, some people were eating more than others and people who were not well off, who normally depended on communion and normally depended on the church to give them a lot of the leftover yeah. food. We're not getting the food. And some people are even getting drunk. And so that caused a lot of disunity in the church. Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop to yeah. communion. Um, well, would you say that First Corinthians 11 gives us more of a, a paradigm or a look at like, uh, what it means to be a part of a church that takes communion rather than just an individual. Because maybe in our American, Western kind of thinking, we kind of take communion for like our own personal benefit. But maybe the biblical pattern, it seems to, like you said, it's more in the context of a church service in a house, being with people. So could you describe that a little bit, the difference between the maybe individual benefit of communion versus what does it mean for us as a, as a people, as a community? Sure. Well, what happened was uh, usually the church would come together, they'd bring food, and they would actually take the food from that agape feast, as they would call it, or love feast, and they would go and feed the poor with the food. They would even take parts of the communion, the, the, the bread and the wine also to those who couldn't make it. And so the church became almost like a benefactor community to each other, but also to the poor in the community. Mm -hmm. And communion was not just a relationship between them and God, but it was showing the relationship or the common union mm -hmm. between each other and Christ. 
Mm -hmm. And so it was never just thought about as an individual coming to God. Uh, it was always an individual coming to God in the context of being part of a family. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul was saying some were sick, some have even died, because when they had the communion meal, they didn't rightly respect or discern the Lord's body, meaning mm -hmm. they were being selfish, self-focused. Um, they weren't thinking about the other. They were just thinking about themselves. And so even when we go to God, uh, we need to also be aware of how we've treated others, mm -hmm. uh, how we are in terms of our attitude, in terms of... Uh, you know, even things like gossip, slander, being self-focused, mm -hmm. that all has a, an effect on our relationship with God. So some people are trying to connect with God, but they don't realize how yeah. dismissive they are of others, especially in the body of Christ. Yeah. Well, Paul says, and that's really good, Bishop, um, uh, but Paul says a couple staggering things uh, when he starts this passage uh, in 1 Corinthians 11. And I think could you unpack what it means for us? Because it sounds kind of harsh, actually. He says at the very, in verse 18, um, no, I'm sorry, in verse 17, he says that your meetings do more harm than good. And when you think of that, like, are you literally saying, it, he's, he's implying it would be better for you not to have church at all or be the church gathered at all because you're actually causing more damage. And then right after that, he said, and he's teaching about communion, and he says, uh, this is not you come together for communion or the Lord's Supper, depending on your translation. And he said, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So it's like they're doing the right. He's saying it's better that you don't gather. And then he's saying the stuff that you're doing, that you're calling communion, well, you're technically doing it, you're actually not doing it. So, what, I mean, how do, how do you interpret that a little bit for our, our current? Yeah, well, they were doing more harm than good because they were individualistic. Mm -hmm. They were just thinking about what they needed for themselves and they were ignoring the needs of others. And those who were poor and hungry went home poor and hungry because all the food was eaten by people who had wealth. And the same thing, uh, people would actually drink all the, the wine and not leave anything for others. And some people actually went to church and got drunk. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was better that they didn't meet because they were exacerbating uh, maybe economic disparities mm -hmm. They were being dismissive of people who were not as wealthy or being dismissive of people who didn't have. And uh, in that sense, they were dishonoring Jesus. So, yeah, it'd be better not to show mm -hmm. up to church and in the name of God, dismiss God's people. So that's one thing we yeah. need to understand. Um, and then he said it wasn't the Lord's Supper, meaning yeah. the whole purpose of the Lord's Supper was our common union, our communion, mm -hmm. meaning we need to get right with God. But even as Jesus said, I think it's in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, before you go to God, before you go to the altar, if you have aught against someone, go to that person first before you offer your gift, meaning mm -hmm. there's a connection between loving God and loving our neighbor. When we don't love our neighbor, mm -hmm. When we don't treat people in, in our congregation correctly, then we're not really loving Jesus. Mm. So that's why he said it's not the Lord's Supper that you're yeah. having. So technically then, uh, people could be in, you know, Resurrection Church or, you know, uh, any church, right? And they could be doing the motion of communion from the human perspective, like, oh, we took communion today. We took the bread and the wine or the bread and the juice. Um, but from the Lord's side, he could actually be saying to us, actually, you didn't do communion because your heart wasn't in the right place. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And that's why he tells us at the end of First Corinthians 11 to examine ourselves mm -hmm. and to judge ourselves while we're taking communion because when we judge ourselves, that, that means whatever God has convicted us of, any sin that we have unconfessed, especially in this context in terms of the attitudes we have towards other Christians, if we don't come to God and surrender that, and if we don't then take action and get it right with our brother and sister, when all 
sometimes it's not possible because of various um, geographic issues or whatever, but if at all possible, if we don't make restitution and get right with our brother and sister, then what is going to happen is we are going to not only not have the eff positive effects of communion, but we're going to have some negative effects. Mm -hmm. God says if you don't judge yourself, he'll judge you. Mm -hmm. And again, Paul said for this reason, some are sick, some have even died. I mean, there are more people who die of bitterness, resentment, and envy than probably die of cancer in this country. Wow. It's just, it, it, it's because it causes a stress on your body yeah. and deteriorate your body. And so communion is an incredible opportunity for us to release unforgiveness, mm -hmm. break those generational patterns of hate, and forgive people the way Jesus forgave us. Yeah, so that, yeah, there's incredibly rich benefits uh, for us when we take communion and when we make sure that we do it from the right heart to love and forgive, like you're saying. So you, you mentioned that verse about some are sick or some are dying prematurely. Uh, and it says, because they're not discerning the Lord's body. That's what the apostle Paul means. And we've kind of in, in the church, right? We use the term, the Lord's body to mean the bread and the wine at communion, meaning the blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus. And then we also use the term the body to reference uh, the people, like we're the body of Christ. Like every member of the church is a part of the body of Christ. So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, you're not properly discerning the Lord's body, do you think he's doing like a word play there? Do you think it has a double meaning or does it just mean the discerning the, the bread and the wine or does it discern mean how we discern our relationships one with another as the body of Christ? Yeah, well, the bread and the wine basically is a metaphor to do something in remembrance of what Christ did. And he died so that we'd be whole. He, as the wounded healer, died so that we could be every whit whole. But that was corporate healing, not just individual. So when we don't think of other people, when we're just looking at communion as some magical way to get grace and forgiveness from God, when the whole essence of communion is to give our life for others the way Jesus gave his life for us, to forgive others the way Christ forgave us. Mm -hmm. So when he says that we didn't rightly discern the body, he is not necessarily only talking about the bread and the wine because that would be very superficial. He's talking about what those emblems actually represent. And in this context of 1 Corinthians 11, it represents both the death, burial, uh, resurrection of Christ, who Jesus is and what he did on the cross, but it also represents the people he died for, the body, the people. Yeah. Wow. So not discerning the Lord's body in the context of 1 Corinthians 11 means that we're not appreciating and honoring and respecting the people that Christ died for as it shows that people let other people go home hungry yeah. and they were selfish, self-focused. And in that context, that's how we understand what it means not discerning the Lord's body. Yeah, okay. That's powerful. Well, I want to ask you a practical question. Uh, if some people are getting drunk and some people are eating too much, like gorging themselves, and other people are leaving hungry, uh, it doesn't quite sound like the same context that we have communion in. Because if, you, if we think of that, like nobody in our church is when we have these little, you know, unleavened bread, like communion crackers or wafers and little cups of grape juice or little goblets of wine, depending on your tradition. And you get like a little tiny piece of bread and a little sip. Like, you know, obviously no, nobody's getting filled or drunk and no one's necessarily, if they came, everybody's leaving hungry because <laughs> they just had a little snack, if you will. So uh, it sounds like what was happening in 1 Corinthians 11 was different. It wasn't just, it was a whole meal or something like that. Can you describe what's the different context between what we do now and what was happening in 1 Corinthians 11? Yes, so the gatherings were centered around a common meal. Everybody would bring food mm -hmm. unless they couldn't afford it. Um, and what that did was establish the church as a family of families because mm -hmm. only families really eat together, mm -hmm. especially on a consistent basis. So that grounded the church as a family, not mm -hmm. an institution, but a family. And so they had a meal, but that meal was culminated with having the bread and having the wine. Mm -hmm. At some point in church history, um, probably after Constantine, it could have been even before that, 
the uh, priests were the only ones allowed to minister the sacraments um, because they wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything unclean or unholy in handling the sacraments. And the sacraments themselves of the bread and the wine became the focal point as a way of God's grace coming into us for forgiveness as opposed to understanding the whole meaning of loving one another through feeding, through caring for each other, through having a common meal which is symbolic and, in, and, and uh, something that showed the love that we had for each other. In other words, uh, you don't have dinner regularly with people you don't know. And so that whole understanding of unity, common unity, common union, yeah. communion, was connected to the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've moved away from that because uh, churches have gotten too big. In those days, they were persecuted. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have more than 30 to 70 people in the typical house. So today, with our sanctuaries, you know, you could fit thousands of people, uh, 300 people even. It's not easy to have a meal with all those people. Uh, but that's why we have abstracted out of that meal the bread and the wine, and it's still powerful because that was the main thing that was focused on mm -hmm. in Matthew 26. They did have a Passover meal, but we don't have any recording of the meal. We know they had it because right. of Jewish history and Jewish tradition. But what Matthew focused on was the bread and the wine, that moment, which was the culmination of the meal. So it's still possible to have a very meaningful experience with God, even without having a dinner with someone else. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of that experience should not just be getting right with God. It has yeah. to be showing our common union right. and oneness with others. Do you think that we've missed the, do you think by not doing meals together that we've missed something very practical or maybe we've overlooked how spiritual just a practical fun meal is and sharing that and that that's hurting us from being able to build unity or oneness? Sure. I think that one of the important things we need in the body of Christ is to have koinonia, which is another word for fellowship. You can't get to know anybody without fellowship. So having common meals, uh, having time together, having fun together, relaxing, that's a sacred thing. That's how we do life. That's how we get to know people. And that's how we could serve together. The, the, the more you like somebody, the easier it is to serve with them. Yeah. And it, it, when you have a meal with people, it's almost like a covenantal act mm -hmm. because you're sharing the same food, the same drink, and there's something sacred about that, that even that food, if it was an animal, you sacrificed an animal, shed blood, so you could share together. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always... Uh, symbolic things involved in meals covenantal that we can't even dive into right now but yeah yeah i think uh, having meals together doesn't have to be every sunday but right. it could be uh smaller groups is important yeah i think that kind of goes back to our western individual mindset i had a man do a training for me and at a pastor's conference i was at about reaching muslims that have come to america um and he talked about how in his research and his experience of reaching out to Muslim, like he would reach out to a lot of college students and try to meet them um, and have them over for a meal. Because I think he said like 90 some percent of uh, Muslims that come for college for even if they're here for like two years for their degree, um, part of their degree program, they, 90 percent of them never step in the home of an American. Um, and they're very open to it. But he said in their culture, if you sit down to have a meal with them, they will literally call all of their close family members to tell them about the experience that they had that somebody invited them into their home. And I think, well, if people invited me over for dinner, I'd have dinner and maybe I'd bring it, maybe I'd tell my parents or my brother or my sister, but it wouldn't really be newsworthy necessarily. I wouldn't stop and call everybody, like, guess who, a neighbor just had me over for dinner, you know, or just invited me over for a barbecue. Uh, but to them, to their culture, they tend, Eastern cultures or maybe uh, Southern cultures, they tend to value relationship. And I think the, the Hebrew mindset the Bible was written from, uh, they valued that a lot more. So uh, could you speak to that a little bit? Like how important was, a, uh, just like you said, it was almost covenantal. So I wonder if you could dig a little deeper into that. Like what's, you know, what's really happening or like what, what did it mean in their day when they sat down and ate together that maybe we miss uh, 
uh, in our culture. Yeah, well, when we look at the Exodus that is shown in Exodus chapter 12 to 14, we see that they were commanded to have a common meal, mm -hmm. which was the lamb, uh, then the bitter herbs and the wine. And by doing that, they were signifying something God was about to do, but also God was going to do in the distant future through Christ, through Messiah, mm -hmm. which they didn't understand fully yet. And so in the redemptive act of God, he was providing for his people at the same time protecting them from the angel of death, mm -hmm. which also goes along with 1 Corinthians 11 because mm -hmm. we see God wants us healed by his yeah. stripes, protecting us from disease and sickness. But you can't separate that from a common meal or common unity mm -hmm. And you might say, well, they just met with their family. No, they only met with their family because they couldn't mm -hmm. fit everybody in the same tent. Mm -hmm. But they all ate the same meal at the same time. So you could argue, no, they, don't. they did this together, yeah. probably three million people. Mm -hmm. And so there is a connection between God's covenant with us and our love for one another even as way back as the Exodus, as the Passover. So it was a covenantal yeah. meal even back then. Jesus showing what was going to happen on the cross, he could have done it on the Day of Atonement, which would make the most sense to some. Wow. He did it on the Passover, yeah. which involved communion because he was signifying or depicting the bond oh. between his people in one of his goals for his death, burial, and resurrection. You can't have Jesus without the church. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm getting revelation as you're teaching because I'm thinking, like, we're right about Thanksgiving Christmas season here. And I never thought about that. But, like, I guess the one thing that brings peace to, like, almost, you know, not every family because sometimes the holidays are hard for people. But to a lot of families and all the chaos and tension we go through is, like, Thanksgiving week, like, everybody's cooking a turkey. Christmas, people are cooking a ham or a roast or a prime rib or maybe they eat more plants like you do. Um, so they have some potatoes or sweet potatoes maybe uh, with a big salad, right? Uh, but but kind of as a nation, we all share a meal and everybody's talking about, you know, what's your turkey recipe? What's your, and it kind of, it brings everybody together and it makes everybody feel good to know that everybody in their neighborhood is doing the same thing. And I, I've never thought of that before. So the communion could have almost been like a weekly or regular thanksgiving or christmas for the church it was like a party they're all eating the same thing and then of course there's deep spiritual significance so it's it, it, it's more than just a fun party but it was kind of like we're all in this together you know like this all has meaning this meal has meaning ultimately the bread and the cup so you're, my mind's just kind of getting blown well, just think of it we're talking about this the same time as thanksgiving weekend yeah it's not an accident as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. and every christian church is having communion at least once a month. Mm -hmm. Many, especially in denominational circles, have it every week, mm -hmm. irrespective of some theological differences, irrespective of some cultural differences, irrespective of our ethnicity. All over the world, the church is yeah. having communion. Yes, yeah, powerful. And that keeps the church focused on Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as the center of our church gathering. Mm -hmm. If we don't have communion, it could be centered on the great preacher, on the great worship experience, mm -hmm. on the great bells and whistles and visceral mm -hmm. experience of the church videos and smokes and all that, smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But when we have communion, mm -hmm. we're connected to the global church, not just the current global church, but the church for two millennia mm -hmm. has been practicing this. And we're connected to the past, to the present, even the future of Christianity by having communion. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah, that's really powerful. Well, I have one more question for you. Um, and that is, and I know that you already, from what you've stated and just from knowing you, uh, that Jesus is the center of all of Christianity. He's the center of the communion meal. He's the center of our unity. Um, but what what does it mean that we focus on him for both just to kind of maybe sum up like the that vertical that relationship that we have with God and then what 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 has Jesus done that's significant for that that we see at communion and what is significant that he's done for us uh, as we relate one to another how does that draw how does that all draw us together in unity at communion sure well vertically Jesus rose from the dead 
far above every principality power and every name that can be named. We see that in Ephesians chapter 1. So he defeated Satan. He took the keys of hell and death, and he brought to life, brought to light death and immortality. Mm. Uh, he brought to light conquering, the conquering of death, and brought immortality. And he was able, in light of all of that, to secure for us an eternal uh, place in his kingdom, which transcends the earth. It goes on through the eons of, of time. Mm. And then in terms of the uh, horizontal, he calls us his body, his bride. Mm -hmm. And if we're his body, that implies that there is a oneness. Um, my finger is still functional because it's connected to my hand, which is connected to my wrist. And that causes it to be part of my body. If I cut my finger off, yeah. uh, my finger would die, mm -hmm. and it would no longer be functional. And that means that people who are disconnected from the local church and not functioning in the local church, and they're using COVID as an excuse, they'd mm -hmm. rather stay home in their pajamas and watch um, something online. Of course, if you have preconditions, we understand it. But as soon as you can, get out to church, be involved physically. Um, but, I mean, can you imagine having a virtual Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't fly with me. Well, uh, some people think they could have virtual church every yeah. week and never have to go back to church. So we have this thing where uh, the church is Christ's body. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, it tells us in Romans 6, we rose with him when uh -huh. we identify with him. When we do not unite with the body, we're actually denying the resurrection and the implications wow. of the resurrection because the resurrection rose all of us. Yeah. And when Romans 6 was written, that was written not to an individual, didn't have Joseph Matera's name on it. It was written to the believing church. Yeah. And so when I think I could function outside of the church, it's disannulling the purpose of communion and it's basically ignoring the objective that Jesus had when he rose to give himself a family of sons. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Very much so. And let me just end this with one other comment. It's not an accident. The first Corinthians 11 and communion runs right into first Corinthians 12, where Paul talks about how we all drink of one spirit. We've been baptized with the same spirit. And then he talks about the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The ear can't say to the eye because you don't hear. You're not part of the body. So he describes the body. He describes the role of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher. Some of the fivefold gifts are mentioned. The end of 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and he talks about the gifts of the spirit. So yeah. all of this was functioning in the church. Mm -hmm. They were moving the gifts. But Paul was saying, not only are you to eat, and consider each other, but you ought to move in the gifts in a way that honors Jesus. Yeah. No one could say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. The spirit of prophecy always testifies of Jesus, not of the prophet. And then we operate in a flow as one body. Then, before he describes the rules of mm -hmm. prophetic ministry in 1 Corinthians 14, he has a whole poetic chapter on love. Yeah. He says, if I... Uh, speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm nothing. If I uh, prophesy and can move mountains and have all faith and have not love, I am nothing, right? Yeah. If I can understand all mysteries, mm -hmm. I have nothing if I don't have love. And so 1 Corinthians 13 is put right in the middle between 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14 on purpose mm -hmm. because if we don't have love, yeah. then we are disannulling Communion, the gifts of the Spirit, and the purpose of the gifts is to edify the church, not to predict elections and not to uh, make ourselves look great, yeah. but to edify the church. Mm -hmm. That is the primary purpose as we see it in 1 Corinthians 14. So all of this flows together. Let's start reading the Bible as one flowing letter. You can't interpret communion without 1 Corinthians 11, yeah. church service context. And you can't interpret the gifts of the Spirit without communion. Mm -hmm. And you can't interpret uh, 
the way to operate in First Corinthians 14 yeah. in the gift of prophecy in tongues without 13, doing it in love and consideration. Yeah. That's great. So, well, we had a great dialogue here. Uh, you're you. just an amazing young leader, <laughs> and we're tracking the same. And yeah. I know Resurrection Church is going to be greatly blessed. My objective here, even though Pastor Michael was already sharing on communion, is I feel like this is such an important subject. I do not want our communion to become a routine. I want to dive down and help you understand as we dig in this subject that every single week we have an opportunity as a church to become one and to think of the other. Well, this is Joseph Matera signing off. Thank you, John, for Thank your you. incredible contribution. Yeah. We work well together. Yeah. God bless. God bless.